Welcome everybody. This is JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeart Radio. I'm Jamie Skadokataya, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to our monthly virtual CEO roundtable. These virtual roundtables lead us up to our on-site CEO roundtables at our C-level networking event, the Telecom Exchange. Next one up is June 20th in Hoboken, New Jersey at the W Hotel. More info at thetelecomexchange.com. Today's roundtable is brought to you by our video collaboration managed services provider, Pinnica. With our video platform, our panelists are able to stream in live video feeds clear across the world. So thank you, Pinnica. And thank you to our viewers who are joining us live here and to those of us joining on demand. So let's get started. Today's topic is the new age of interconnectivity. Technological advances and for sure increasing network capacity demands are posing new and progressively difficult challenges for network interconnection. We have a wonderful C-level lineup here today for you from four absolutely innovative companies who are addressing these interconnectivity challenges, not just for today, but also tomorrow. So helping us to break this down, I am honored to introduce our all-star panelists to you. Kicking it off, we have Mr. Bob DeSantis. He is the CEO of 365 Data Centers. 365 is a leading provider of carrier neutral hybrid data center and managed colo solutions in strategic edge markets. Also joining us, Mr. Ben Edmond, he's the CEO and founder of Connected to Fiber, providing a SaaS platform for network buyers and owners, offering improved transparency, speed, and effectiveness. We also have Mr. David Erickson, he's the founder and CEO of FreeConferenceCall.com, as well as the founder and CEO of CarrierX. You probably know Dave as the innovative entrepreneur who sparked a movement with free teleconferencing last decade or so. And now him and his team are reimagining the traditional carrier model and technologies. And rounding on our panel today, we have Mr. Mike Francis. He's the chairman and CEO of JMF Solutions Incorporated. JMF is the pioneer of technological innovative network systems to advance internet and voice services. And what I personally love, he donates a lot of these services to schools and charities. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. And I love how each of you really bring this unique perspective up and down the OSI staff to the topic of interconnectivity. So let's get going here. First question, and we'll go right around the horn, starting first with you, Bob. So if you could set the stage for us, tell us a little bit about your 365 Data Center's business model, and more so how your company might be innovating interconnectivity today. Bob? Well, sure. Well, uh, Jamie, very happy to participate today. and. Uh, just briefly with regard to our business and our business model, uh, 365 Data Centers is a leading provider of hybrid data center solutions. Uh, we're in 10 geographic, uh, geographically diverse markets throughout the eastern United States. We operate um, carrier neutral, connectivity rich uh, data centers in uh, Boca Raton, Florida, Buffalo, New York, Chicago, Detroit, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Indianapolis, uh, Nashville, Philadelphia, New York, and Tampa. So we're we're pretty much nationwide, East Coast, uh, East Coast based at least. And um, we have a combined 195,000 square feet and over 13 megawatts of power in place to serve our customers. Um, with regard to connectivity, we maintain a redundant fiber network with 30 points of presence uh, nationally including direct connectivity uh, to our data centers in the NAP of, of the Americas down in Miami. Uh, we couple that with about 300 peering partners, so quite, quite a connectivity-rich uh, focused business. Our target customers um, segments include carriers, uh, content providers, cloud operators, and small and intermediate size enterprise customers. Our carrier customers exceed 30 and uh, have more than 130 POPs across our 10 data centers. So we're pretty, uh, pretty engaged with the carrier and connectivity community. Um, the company offers a broad product set, including co-location, uh, Metro Ethernet, Long Haul, uh, MPLS, uh, network services, blended IP uh, choices, remote VR, cloud compute and storage, as well as some business continuity services. And uh, we're proud to have a 100% uptime record 
and uh, in compliance with uh, all the major industry standards. So that, that's, uh, that's a little bit of background on uh, what we're calling the new 365, uh, which has been uh, focused on uh, these broader product sets and, uh, and uh, much more connectivity over the past year. And um, with regard to your question as to how we approach connectivity, best practices, or innovation, we recognize that there are multiple uh, types of transport and transit platforms and network elements in the current market. Uh, even more so than there were four or five years ago. So we use a combination of hardware platforms and a variety of network transport elements uh, to provide transit and internet connectivity, uh, you know, with rapid, with the objective of rapid offloading, you know, to the, uh, to the uh, destination points. So this approach provides, in our view, a better user experience, you know, by getting data and IP traffic to their destinations much quicker and with fewer intermediary networks involved. Um, and by, by being a provider of layer two services, we can also efficiently connect our customers, you know, with their production and backup environments within our various data centers. So it's kind of a twofold uh, focus for us because obviously a lot of our revenue is generated from the Colo uh, customers. Um, you know, having a connectivity-rich data center environment as we have and an ecosystem of carriers and peering partners, um, you know, along with, you know, our own fiber, you know, provides us with a significant advantage and I think it provides anybody in the same position with a significant advantage in providing, you know, managed interconnectivity services. And then, you know, also to go a little further downstream, you know, by automating some basic tools such as adding IP4 addresses, prefixes on an automated basis. You know, all of that are little things that ensures more efficient IP connectivity. So, you know, I think that's how we kind of approach connectivity at 365. Wonderful. Ben? Great. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to participate today in the, uh, in the video conference. Um, my name is Ben Edmond. I'm the CEO and founder of Connected to Fiber. We are a SaaS platform purpose-built for the connectivity industry. Our mission in life is to help the industry grow, transact, and interconnect. Uh, the platform is built around a premise that location matters and perspective matters. So we help uh, connectivity providers, whether they're up the stack providing VoIP service or down the stack providing raw infrastructure like dark fiber or co-location, you know, understand the locations, their assets with market perspectives, uh, both in terms of competitiveness and the demand side, and then take action. Uh, we believe the, uh, the industry is going through some major fundamental changes that are, you know, absolutely exciting in terms of uh, raw infrastructure from a build-out perspective, next generation technologies, and frankly, a regulatory market that uh, that is uh, causing a lot of people to, uh, to pay attention. All those things combined uh, into, you know, our platform to help people grow. And that's our mission in life. And we do so with a, uh, a lot of visual insight, automation, and intelligence. A great lead in to Dave. Yeah, I'm, I'm Dave Erickson. I'm the CEO of uh, Carrier X, which we're probably most notable for creating freeconferencecall.com, which is at some points the largest uh, retail brand of conferencing on the planet. We have about 800,000 companies in the United States that we work with. Um, we've served about 1% of humanity with free conference call and completing calls between two people and, and uh, offering free communications. Um, my specialty is voice. My specialty is disruptive voice. Um, I see the future of, of, you know, the Internet of Things and voice and interconnectivity and all these things as being a white space for disruption. I think that there's a lot of um, big companies with big company ways that have been around for, for big histories, and, and I think that things are, are moving very fast. I think that things are changing very rapidly, and I think, you know, the, the agility is going to be found in and middle market kind of companies and smaller companies, emerging growth companies, things of that nature versus, you know, sort of the big, huge, iconic, iconic companies. And, and um, 
Technologies have advanced dramatically and we look to stay on top of those. We do all our uh, in-house technology. We build everything in-house, all the way from our customer support to the core uh, media mixing of the voice is all connected and all um, put together. So uh, we look forward to this time. We, 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 we are very excited about what's happening and, and the potentials and the possibilities and it's very exciting to be on this panel. Um, with people that share that that like kind of enthusiasm to go, go do something new. Absolutely, Mike. Hi, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me on. So I'm CEO of JMF Solutions. We are a very advanced technology company. Um, we're focused on connecting clients to the data center, moving them out of the headquarters model. Um, so fiber is pretty big for us. Interconnecting with other carriers is huge. Uh, we have probably a little over 30 uh, network to network interfaces with small and large carriers. Um, once we get the client connected into the data center, there we have an array of virtualized services. So we're, we're pretty heavily invested in uh, software defined networking, virtual routing, virtual switching, you know, and virtual services. Um, we have three operating divisions and one intellectual property division. Uh, so we service enterprise and mid-market companies. Uh, then we've taken all the products and services that we provide on an enterprise level and we've turned them also into wholesale services that we sell at a reduced price, of course, to other uh, carriers, MSPs, ITSPs. Um, and then we have an MBU business where we provide bulk services to you know large you know, uh, buildings, condos, developments. Uh, we weren't doing a good bit of fiber to the home, but we pulled that back um, and are really focused on mid-market and enterprise right now. I have a very advanced, hmm? That's it interesting. So I have a very advanced team. Um, I like to think of us as a bunch of nerds who became entrepreneurs, who became businessmen. Um, so, and it's a lot of fun. I mean, we're having a really good time. We're, we're staying ahead of the curve, you know, we're small enough uh, where our clients really matter to us. You know, a $100 million company that it, they're our bread and butter, whereas to say, you know, a Windstream or a CenturyLink or an AT&T, they're just another number. They really don't get the type of service or support. Uh, so, so we see ourselves as the real advocate for the client uh, where they're our, you know, they're our bread and butter. Um, they get they get an advanced person on the phone, you know, almost immediately. Uh, we're helping them design, deploy, and manage these very advanced networks. Um, we're educating our clients, and we're helping them integrate all these different technologies and all these different buzzwords, you know, and they really understand what they are. So, I really appreciate you having having me on, and I'm I'm looking forward to answering these questions. Well, we're, we're we so appreciate all of you, gentlemen. Uh, being here and offering your expertise. Looking back over the past 12 to 24 months or so, could you tell us what is the one technological advancement that has been transformational for you? And if applicable, how does the rollout or deployment of this technology like? Any lessons learned you can share with us? And say more, we'll start with, with Bob. You know, it's an interesting question, uh, uh, Jamie. And, you know, from my perspective, you know, advancement in technologies, uh, you know, really hasn't, it really hasn't been that many changes beyond what I would refer to as capacities. And, uh, you know, obviously that's huge. So, you know, the speeds and feeds have certainly grown from what had been, you know, a high of, uh, you know, one gigabit delivery to, you know, now, you know, what is, uh, you know, service level provider levels of 10 gig, 40 gig, and even 100 gig. And so when I refer to speeds, I'm referring to the capacity that can be handled by a port on a network gear and feeds referring to the network to build ability to transport at these same capacities. You know, otherwise, uh, these port configurations are underutilized. So that's really, that's really uh, you know, what I've seen as the major swing in the last several years, obviously. And um, you know, selecting equipment vendors that can keep up with the capacity growth without the need to to do a complete hardware changeover at much, you know, much more excessive cost, you know, has been the real challenge, at least from our perspective. And so, you know, most, 
you know, most current generation platforms uh, do not provide much scale without a drastic hardware cost increase. Uh, however, a number of next generation platforms that are now on the market have done quite well, you know, with the advent of, you know, stacking technologies and, uh, and uh, multi-chassis solutions so that capacity upgrades can be made on a much more cost-efficient basis, so, you know, predominantly with card changeouts. And so, you know, from our perspective, I guess, as we think about the last 12 to 24 months and going forward, it's, it's just being a prudent manager of these speeds and feeds, you know, and by adhering to that type of strategy, you know, it, it allows us to continue, in our view, to be, you know, a superior connectivity provider. But it's been, you know, advancement along those capacities and managing those speeds and feeds that, uh, you know, have been, you know, our biggest challenge. And, you know, we, we feel we've been successful with it, but, you know, the challenge changes every day almost in, in that respect. Thank you. Um, ben? Great. So, uh, so from my perspective, there's, there's really two fundamental technological leaps forward the industry's made over the last uh, two years. And, and we're still in the early innings of it, but it's, it's the adoption of uh, software defined you know, networks and uh, the movement to the cloud. It, it's really changed the perspective of, and, and the perspective I'm talking about is the, the fragmentation that exists in the last mile to lead up to the, the need to interconnect networks. The reality is we track over 2,319 physical networks that still connect into all the enterprise locations across the country. And with software-defined networking, there's a, there's a decoupling of the, uh, the network from the, the last mile that's enabled like it's never been enabled before. And that shift is really helping people think about how to best solve for the need for those speeds and feeds to increase to accommodate the reality that the application is no longer sitting inside the four walls of the, with the user. It's now moved into the, into the cloud or into the data center, as Bob suggested, and as business operates. And those two fundamental changes are really taking a foothold in the market over the last two years. And, you know, from our perspective, really help shine a light on the need to understand all the moving parts and uh, and participate fully. Do you see that as well? Uh, yeah, I think that that you know the the ability to do um, all of this interconnecting and things is has become much more uh, rich environment over the last you know couple couple few years. We're we're very interested in app-to-app -app voice, things of that nature. Um, you know, in a voice industry, which I've been in for a couple of decades, you know, interconnecting, um, cross-connecting, peering, you know, all of the different terms. There's, there's a, a number of things that have come in that have kind of stifled what should actually happen because of, you know, competition and people competing with each other and, and whatnot. And we see things getting more complex. Um, you know, our, our, our vision is not that, you know, a handful of carriers exchange traffic for us all. Um, our vision is that it goes from app to app and that, you know, you look at a company like Twilio, I think they've got like 500,000 app developers, right? There's going to be millions of apps and we're going to have millions of apps talking to millions of apps. And I think the things that are um, exciting to us is just the scalability we've seen in transcoding because I think these apps are going to want to work in their own technologies and keep their technologies unique and and um, you know to to themselves. You know some of them have developed uh, different compression decompression algorithms that they want to work on. I think that you know direct connecting those and asking competitors to do things is going to be difficult. It always has been, and we see that the potentials for aggregating intermediaries and doing scalable, you know, transcoding and, and uh, settlements and all those kinds of things has really increased in the last two years. And we've been uh, working hard at our company HD Tandem to, to kind of be a, a rock in the middle of the river, if you will. I mean, the ultimate goal is that everybody's direct connected, but when you look at the number of people that are direct connected today in comparison to the number of people that are just coming on to want to do something, you know, we're, we're kind of looking at a losing game. And we think that some intermediaries will be very helpful working between competitors that can't work with each other. 
um, you know, doing transcoding, doing things that intermediaries can do in a, in a fiduciary basis that, that, that's very beneficial to these people. And I think, um, you know, we do about 3 to 5% of the traffic in the United States right now through HD Tandem. Um, we look to do a lot more of that. We look to, to really increase not with the old carriers, but with the new application dividers, providers with their new technologies and to be able to work with their technologies and scale that. And I think that's what's happened in the last two years. Amazing. And, and Mike, do you uh, see this as well? Yeah, to me, um, there's so many disruptive technologies and there's so many things that, that are happening, you know, in these industries. You know, the adoption of IPv6, um, how, how important uh, BGP is, virtual routing, virtual switching, software-defined networking, cloud, SD-WAN, you know, all these things. So, so what's really important is how do you tie all that together, you know, education, information, integration. So with bringing it all together, um, standardizing on how it all works, standardizing on how everyone connects with each other, how they talk to each other. Um, I've seen some extremely innovative software-defined networks out there. I mean, we've been deploying one ourselves, um, but we're connected to several others, and they're really cool, some of the stuff that they're doing and, and how easy they make it for, you know, another carrier to cross-connect to another carrier by clicking a button, you know. Um, but no, all these APIs and all these integrations, uh, they're not standardized, right? So it, every time you want to do something with somebody else, you're having to have a whole development team work on something to, to integrate a, another solution into what you're doing. Um, so standardization, um, educating the clients, your employees, uh, even your vendors in, in a lot of cases. There's a ton of misinformation out there. Um, I'm a you know, network and systems engineer background programmer. You know, so to me, the, a lot of the, the stuff out there is just sales and marketing garbage, you know, and, and clients hear it and they want to buy this stuff and then they think it's all magic. They're like, okay, well, you just plug it all in, it all works, right? You know, and we're talking about billion dollar banks that think this, you know, so, um, and that's not what it's like. So you have to be the advocate for the client, um, you have to educate them and you have to, to be a part of their team and help integrate these technologies properly. Um, you see, to me, that I'd say 90% of the companies out there that are selling this stuff really have no idea what they're doing. Um, they, they're, there's a good 10%, they really get it. You know, they're fun to work with, they understand technology, they've got advanced teams. You know, all the other 90% should probably be doing sales for the other 10%. So. I couldn't agree with you more, Mike. Um, but uh, it would take us directly into our next question. What do you see as the top challenges today facing network interconnectivity, particularly as everything is moving to the cloud? Uh, we, we heard interoperability and we heard misinformation out there, and not a lot of education. Um, but, and we'll, again, we'll go right around the horn. Oh, we'll start with you, Bob. What do you see as those potential roadblocks here? What are those challenges that we're facing today? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to try to answer this question as one of the one of the 10% that should be in the business of selling cloud and network, uh, Mike, because I, I do I do agree with his premise. Um, well, you know, let, let's just start with the basics. I mean, you know, cloud cloud from a customer's perspective is really just uh, using someone else's hardware and software, right? And uh, and so the challenge, you know, that anyone like 365 or any service provider in the cloud market has, whether you're way up the stack or kind of just in the cloud compute and storage business as we are, is to make that customer feel that that server and software are still on the customer's premise. You know, that, that's really, you know, that's the home run if you can deliver it in that manner. So, you know, that can be accomplished in, in our view only by providing scalable storage, compute, and access capabilities at each of your connectivity points. So the customer and the cloud resource, you know, are as physically close and as seamless as possible. And I guess it's really that seamless as possible, which really brings us back to the topics of connectivity. And, you know, from our view, it's very difficult to deliver this service at a very high level across you know, uh, multiple sites, if you're just going to get wed to 
a single approach, whether it's in terms of hardware providers or network vendors or elements, because your equipment and transport network need to be configured, you know, to meet the specific market customer's requirements. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, the port capacities, the network capacity and availability, you know, all need to be managed within each market to deliver the best customer experience, uh, you know, for your cloud customers. And, you know, that's what, that's what takes the effort and, you know, having, you know, having a bit knowledge and capability both in terms of the network and the cloud platform is key because if you're just under, operating a cloud platform and depending on somebody else to operate your network, you're not going to connect those two elements together to make you successful. So, you know, in most cases, a mixed vendor solution can be much better. But, you know, there's cost, you know, you need, you need a broader set of knowledge within your sales engineers, your network engineers, your system engineers. And so, it, you know, there's a balance. And uh, if you're not focused on supporting your business that way, uh, then I agree, you ought to be in the other 90%. And, and that's kind of my view on, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, what's facing cloud providers as a challenge. Definitely is, definitely is. Um, ben? I would uh, tend to agree a lot with what Bob said. Uh, you know, from my perspective, the adaptability and the understanding of really how to manage that multi-service provider environment that is going to continue to exist and expand. And you know, to, to David's earlier point, I think the complexity just increases dramatically. Um, both what we're seeing today and over the next uh, three to five years, and understanding what the optimal last mile solution is, what the, uh, the ability to interconnect, whether it's app to app or, uh, you know, hybrid uh, environment, you know, that complexity is going to grow. And ultimately, the users want seamless. They want uh, an, an end user experience as if the application was sitting on their desktop. And, uh, and it's going to be a struggle for the industry as a whole and to uh, to deliver on that, but through you know through the proper interconnections, through the the right uh, standards and, uh, and communication and collaboration, you know, ultimately that's the way we're going, and we're going to have to s solve for it. The cloud providers themselves, I believe, are the ones that are going to be faced with the most pressure, which in turn will be put back on the uh, the data centers and the network providers to to deliver because that end user experience ultimately drives the revenue stream for the whole industry. So, so what we see is, is, is you know, kind of a, a, a barrier or things that are, that are uh, you know, considered problems. One, one would be, you know, just the state, current state of regulation today in voice. And there's an NPRM out on intercarrier compensation right now. We're making comments and, and we hope to see something wonderful, wonderful happen there. Um, our telephone system, our voice system hasn't changed for 100 years, right? Innovation has actually been stifled on our network due to the regulation and due to the competition that we tried to regulate in um, where, you know, two competitors don't really want to work with each other but kind of want to do the other one under. And, and I think that um, we need to fix that. I think we need to find some areas where we can all agree to create something that unbuckles innovation from the actual regulation, allows people to advance their codecs, advance their video codecs, advance the information content delivery networks and all those things, and not somehow be tied to a regulation that holds some old technology in place that doesn't allow that to happen. Another area where I see issue is, is that, you know, historically the voice network has been built with, you know, a lot of the intelligence at the edge and, and sort of that edge provider is your provider. And I think that as we go into the future, we're going to want to see that kind of stuff more at the core decided by the edge that the consumer can say, hey, I want to forward my phone to my Skype app. I want to forward my phone to, you know, this app, that app, to this home, to that plane, to whatever case it may be. And that's only going to be in centralized intelligence versus the edge intelligence that, that, that exists today. Um, in kind of the, you know, legacy network. Um, so those are kind of the roadblocks we see, but we think that, that, that the technology to bypass all of that is already here. There isn't any technological advances that need to be made to complete, you know, the Shangri-La, if you will, of, of voice and applications and interconnectivity. I think what it is is it's some careful regulation and things that we don't get things that actually block out the ability for 
a new upcoming company to say, hey, I want to be a part of this voice exchange. I want to be in the refrigerators and everywhere where voice is just like everybody else. And I want to pay my way in and get in and, and be accepted. And I think that right now in our current regulatory you know, uh, status, that's, that's very difficult. I think mean, we need to change that. Mike, is the uh, regulatory uh, issues uh, top of your mind when you think of roadblocks for Shangri-La? <laughs> yeah, um, man, we've got a really smart panel here. The, <laughs> to me, it's about keeping up connectivity. So today, it's 100 gig everything, right? So uh, you've got five, you know, fifth generation. 5G, 5G wireless coming, cloud, everything cloud. I mean, cloud, cloud, cloud. And not only do you need the connectivity into the cloud, you need the connectivity between other clouds so you can replicate services and do all these things. So, I mean, connectivity is just, you know, it's multiplying on a, on a crazy scale. So, it's, it's, it still blows me away when a carrier we're connected with has a problem doing a 10 gig service for us. You know, I mean, uh, these, we learn these things the hard way. So this makes me think about like our network started out at this little 100 meg network. Man, we thought that was like everything we needed, right? And then we spent all this money to upgrade to one gig, one gig network. Well, what we should have really done is gone from 100 megabit to 10 gigabit. Um, and from 10 gig instead of 40, we should go to 100, you know? So we, we shouldn't be looking at the next thing. We should be looking at the next, next thing because the, this stuff's expensive. It takes time to deploy. It takes time to understand. And you know we're we're outgrowing our own networks every day. Um, then the platforms. You know, so say you've got 100, 100 gigs switching and routing. Well, next you got to have all the servers to support it. So I know plenty of carriers, um, including us in some instances. You know, we have 100 gig backbone connectivity yet. Uh, we're still running clusters of servers with VMware and our cloud on top of that, and they're all 10 gig connectivity. So if you're doing virtual routing and switching, well, you need 100 gig servers too. So um, it's keeping up with this technology, which is so important. Um, and some are doing a good job at it, some are not. And the less you keep up with it, the more expensive and time consuming and painful it's going to be. Very true. All right, so this is the time now, gentlemen, where I'm going to ask you to take out the crystal ball, the magic crystal ball, peer into future. Um, so looking forward, clearly, um, as mentioned and, and Mike so eloquently said, there's just this endless demand for capacity. Um, and with IoT, AI, that's taking off. We've really just begun to experience the onslaught um, of data demands, uh, capacity demands from IoT and AI. Um, where do you see the industry heading in the next year or two, and, and how does innovative interconnectivity play an important role in this process? Bob? Well, well Jamie, I, 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 uh, I'm going to take the liberty to say I'm sure I speak for everyone, and we could spend an hour on this topic each, uh, but uh, I'm going to focus uh, on just speaking to the direction of uh, the services that 365 currently provides. My, my partners and I uh, spent an awful lot of time on this uh, over the last uh, year or so uh, prior to acquiring the 365 platform within this past year and then adding immediately a lot of network capacity and capability to it because, uh, you know, in our view, you know, in order to drive the utmost efficiency in things like the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence and all the other consumer on-demand information that, uh, you know, is you know, as, as Mike just said, it's growing exponentially. Uh, when it comes to hybrid data center services, whether it's including co-location, remote disaster recovery, cloud, storage, compute, you name it, just managing various network elements, everything in our view is moving towards the edge. And that was very, very much, fo you know, our focus. Uh, you know, eight of our ten data centers are on the edge. We have two that are in major, major cities that need to be there because of connectivity points. But, um, you know, this move towards the edge is not only driven by the content providers and owners who are just, you know, commercially motivated to deliver low latency information and video to consumers, but, but also by the cloud customers who is, you know, we mentioned a little earlier, you know, wants services delivered in a manner as if it feels 
like the underlying equipment and software is right on their premises. And so again, the, that's, the, that's the view I have, that things are moving much to the edge, very, very quick, much quicker than even a lot of the news you hear about. And as to, you know, a two-year view on connectivity, I don't know, as, I go as far as Mike, but I, I will agree with him, but I would suspect all network transfer capacities below a gig, even up to a gig, you know, will be substantially obsolete in the next two years. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be talking about it like DSL and T1s, um, for those of us who go back that far. And, um, and, you know, we'll be headed towards, you know, cost efficient. It's not really there yet, but cost efficient 10 gig minimums. I'm not going to say to the home, but certainly in business environments across the board. And, uh, you know, that, that's where I think we're headed in terms of connectivity. And it might be much quicker than I'm even projecting. Amazing. Ben, what's your projection? My projection is uh, a simple four-letter word of more. You know, more bandwidth, more complexity, more choice, uh, more locations, more mobility, more cloud applications, more service providers. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the general trend that, that we see is the, the world, you know, wants what the industry is delivering. The, the consumption of services rather than legacy hardware infrastructure locations, the consumption of faster, better, cheaper to drive productivity, entertainment, and, and others, all that is happening, you know, and, and converging in a lot of different, uh, you know, challenging ways for the industry. And I think that just increases the amount of capital needed to keep up with uh, the pace of uh, demand is increasing and the, the penetration of the raw infrastructure into where the users are back to the peering points. I agree with the general trend to the edge and that's just a, uh, a need to keep up with uh, the, uh, the simple need of more um, to, uh, to keep pace with where we're going. Dave, M-O-R-E, do you agree? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely think, think we get um, more. Um, I hope it's more good and not more of you know what 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 we've had. Um, I think that that what we'll see in the next two years is that we'll see high definition voice um, be exchanged through a public global exchange, which would, would be exciting. I think we'll also see uh, the focus on, on carriers at the edge change to applications at the edge, and and you know more of the carrier focused stuff will be either direct connected or, you know, an, an aggregated intermediary that, that serves the edge better. Um, I think, you know, with, with HD voice and app, you know, apps were, it's going to be millions and millions of, of, of apps that, that find a common way to all, all connect. And I think it'll be done through some, some intermediary functions, but I think it will inspire and make direct connectivity happen at a much better pace than it's happening now. Thanks, Bob. Um, and Dave, Mike, uh, are pushing to the edge. Uh, how do you feel? I think that's very important. Um, man, this, there's a lot on this topic. The, to me, I kind of have this vision of no one really caring what the speed is anymore. Like all these carriers are out there selling, you know, one gig to the home and all this stuff. Well, at some point, does it even matter? I mean, let's just provide the capacity that's necessary, you know, and connect the clients to everything, right? Because that's what they want. They just want to be connected to everything. They want it to work. Do they really care what the speed is? I mean, some dudes sit around, do speed tests all day long and put in support tickets when it's not what they think it should be. But, you know, that's not your typical client. They just want to run their business. Right, so you connect them, you get them to the data center as fast as possible, um, you get them out of the headquarters model. So the things that I feel are going to revolutionize that are BGP and IPv6, because that's something you can take all the way down to the client level. Right, I really have this vision of BGP and IPv6 being utilized all the way down to the business level, where right now it's mostly, you know, it is how the internet works. Um, most people have no idea what it is, but the when you bring it all the way down to the business level and everything or the majority of what you're doing is functioning on IPv6, then, and it's easy to support BGP or some other technology, you know, something needs to probably come out to replace that. 
Um, but when you can, each individual business or entity can have its own IP space, and there's plenty of it now, um, and then announce that to whatever carriers that they want to be uh, their service providers, whether it's Comcast or Mediacom or AT&T or JMF Wayfly or anybody, or 365 data centers, doesn't really matter. They have their IP space, it's theirs, and they can announce it to everybody, and all of a sudden the global network opens up. Um, I think the other things that are going to revolutionize this are quantum computing, quantum networking, uh, blockchain. Man, the stuff going on with blockchain is crazy. Um, it's it's kind of like the wild, wild west and the dot-com boom right now. But, but what came out of that is what we have now. So, you know, the whole next revolution of technology with quantum computing and blockchain, uh, which I think those two things are going to go very well together, uh, it's really going to revolutionize the way everything we're doing now works. Uh, the, the biggest roadblocks I see are government agencies trying to figure out how to regulate everything that we're doing, um, old school companies trying to keep their hands in the pot when they don't need to be there anymore. Uh, those are the biggest roadblocks, and we got to figure out how to collectively get past that. Well said, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for your expertise. Uh, we've covered everything from IPv6 to getting to the edge to more of everything. Uh, loved it. Uh, so much more to talk about. We're going to have a whole other round here on blockchain just because it got me very excited about that. Um, so thank you for your expertise today on the new age of interconnectivity. Again, our all-star panelists here, Bob DeSantis, 365 Data Centers, Ben Edmond, Connected to Fiber, David Erickson, PreConferenceCall.com, as well as Carrier X and others, <laughs> and Mike Francis of JMF Solutions Incorporated. This wraps up our latest virtual CEO roundtable. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you gentlemen and everyone watching live at Telecom Exchange June 20th in Hoboken, New Jersey. For thoughts, questions, or to feature your C-level here next time, go ahead and email us at pr at jsa.net. Thanks for tuning in to JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. Until next time, happy networking.